it's 7 o'clock. Welcome, everybody, and happy Easter. And uh, there are all kinds of Easter treats up there donated by two of our bunnies. So uh, please come and help yourself. And uh, you're doing it because you, you love Jesus, right? And you're grateful for the resurrection. We're grateful. Yes. So uh, let's. Uh, and because we like sweets. Wow, but that's way down the list. And, and, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're grateful to <laughs> Jesus was born and then crucified for, was crucified for us. For our carrot cake, yes. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we continue to be so thankful, so grateful for all that you did for us at the cross and at the empty tomb. Lord, as we come together and study your word, we pray that these things would continue to linger on our hearts and minds, and we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us as we begin this new book, Lord, and help us to hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so last time we finished up the Gospel of John, 25 weeks on the Gospel of John, and we've got about four more left. We're going to probably go through the rest of this month, or most of it. And I thought we could fit in... Wow. It sounds like a TV sanitarium in here. <laughs> I thought we could fit in this, what's remaining in our time, this little book of the Bible, 1 John, um, to kind of piggyback onto... The Gospel of John, and, and at the end of last year we looked at 2nd and 3rd John, and earlier we looked at Revelation. So this will finish all of the Johannine books in the New Testament. I've never heard that, Johannine. That's the adjective, Johannine. You've got Pauline and Lucan and... Oh, really? Yeah. So this is not an easy book of the Bible. Um... There's a lot of really good stuff in John, but we'll talk here. I always like to, to begin with an intro. We'll talk here about why this is a challenging book of the Bible for us to study. So the author is... John. Hey, okay, good job. Gold star for all of you tonight. <laughs> Uh, probably the youngest of the disciples, again, the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, uh, called one of the sons of thunder, um, one of the inner circle of the disciples with Peter and James. Quite often, Jesus would leave nine of the disciples and just take Peter, James, and John with him, like up on the Mount of Transfiguration or in the Garden of Gethsemane. John was part of the inner circle. He probably was Jesus' cousin. His mother and Jesus' mother probably were sisters. And again, we know that from looking at the four Gospels, different lists of women at um, the cross and the empty tomb and in other places where it lists the women that went along with the disciples and matching up, you know, they didn't always describe the women in the same way. Um, when you match up the women who are listed, you get one who says his mother's sister, you get one who says the mother of James and John, you get one who says her name was Salome, and you kind of put all that together and say, those three are probably the same woman. So, unless they're describing a, there were more women there than we realized. That's where it gets a little tricky. Joshua, did you say they're the sons of Jebedee? <coughs> Zebedee. Zebedee. And that's the father's name? The father's okay. name, yes. Quite often that's how they're referred to, the and sons the of Zebedee. sons of Thunder? Yes, that was a nickname. And why? <laughs> because they <laughs> had tempers. <clears throat> And remember at one point the the town that wouldn't go along with them and they said, Jesus, should we call fire down upon that town to burn it up? <laughs> Jesus said no, by the way. <laughs> okay. So John was the last of the disciples to die. 
he's the only one probably that was not killed as a martyr although he suffered a great deal for his faith he was sent at the end of his life to the island of Patmos which is a prison island uh, you can see that on your map there this was written toward the end of his life somewhere around 90 or in the early 90s AD so we're talking around 60 years after the resurrection at the end of John's life this is one of the last pieces of the New Testament to be written but it was known by the early church fathers as early as around the year 100 so within 10 years this was a piece of writing that was known throughout the church and we have written uh, references to this book and reference that this was written by John and was known by different leaders and teachers and when you compare the writing style of the Gospel of John to this letter it matches because there are certain there are people who make it their business that they study the writing and the word usage of different books of the Bible and so they'll tell you well this word here is only used by John it's not used by any other writer and I say that's great can we move on <laughs> but that can be helpful sometimes so um, they this uh, was a book that was uh, known to be written by John and was very quickly accepted as part of the New Testament it was probably written from the city of Ephesus and again you have your your map there um, where Ephesus is, it's in modern day Turkey. Um, there, the town is gone now, it's only a ruin because the river that ran through it and the bay that it flowed into silted up. And so, you know, that's not good when you're a commerce town like Ephesus was. But at the time when John lived there, it was a city of about 300,000 people. It was huge, especially for the ancient world. <clears throat> it was the capital city of its province and home to one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Silver Star, to who can tell me what ancient wonder was in Ephesus? The Colossus of Rhodes was on the island of Rhodes, not in Ephesus. <laughs> But good choice. Yes. The Temple of Artemis. The Temple of Artemis. Because you just studied in Acts. I was waiting for something to say something. It sounded familiar. Remember the riot in Ephesus? Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And they almost killed Paul and all of that. Maybe you need to go back over that chapter oh. again. <laughs> We're sorry, Sean. Oh. It's also on the It's paper. right here in the paper. It's also right on your paper, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. So the church in Ephesus was founded by Paul, but he, of course, was moving all over the place. He had a, a, an itinerant ministry. Other people throughout the years had been leaders in this church, including Priscilla and her husband Aquila or Aquila or however you want to pronounce his name. Apollos is another one of the uh, church leaders there. And the tradition was that John went there with Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's where she died, uh, according to tradition. Uh, you can see her tomb there if you want to talk about that. Talk with Sherry Kaito and Barb Wolf, who both have been there. I have not. Uh, they can tell you what they saw and what they experienced. But the, the church fled Jerusalem just before Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70 AD. 
the great Roman Jewish war that destroyed the temple. It hasn't been rebuilt since. Um, the church paid attention to Jesus' prophecies, which we read in the Gospels. They read the signs. They saw what was coming. They left, including the apostles, and John went to Ephesus, where he spent most of the rest of his life. Uh, one of the theories is he wrote to what are the seven churches that are listed at the beginning of Revelation, Ephesus being one of them, <clears throat> and that this letter was also addressed to those seven churches, and that he his authority kind of extended from Ephesus to these other, like he was, they didn't quite have the administrative understanding that we have of a bishop, but that he kind of was a leader over a larger geographic region. There were local pastors also in these churches, but that his he could write a letter to these churches and they would listen because it's John. He walked with Jesus. He's an apostle, you know. So, however, you're going to see while we call this a letter, an epistle, it doesn't read like Paul's letters. He doesn't begin John, apostle of Jesus, you know, and to the churches of whatever. In fact, you're going to be very confounded by the way that he begins the letter. So many have said, was this really a letter or was this a sermon he wrote? Or more like a, a pamphlet or a, a treatise or, or something like that, that he wrote and sent out <clears throat> to the different churches. It reads more like that. And if you're used to Paul's very clear style... Paul was a lawyer, and so he had a very clear, organized way of thinking. When you read one of Paul's letters, he has an argument that you can trace from the beginning of the letter to the end of the letter. And usually it's the beginning of the letter is, here's what I want to say, let me prove it to you. And then you get to the last quarter or third of the letter, and it's, okay, here's now how you are to live based on what I have just taught. He has a very clear style. John says something, and then he says something, and then he says something. <laughs> and then he comes back to what he said here, and then he comes back to what he said here, and it kind of goes around, and some have called it, it's like a symphony. All of the instruments get their time to play, and it fits together, it all works together, <clears throat> but if you're looking for a clear line, you're not going to be happy. <laughs> That's not the way John's mind obviously worked. How wonderful that God uses all different kinds of brains and thinkers. And for those of us like me, that like a clear, organized, we go from A to B to C to D. That's great. And for those of you that are more artistic and it's like, let's go around the circle a couple more times. <laughs> you know? If you've ever been said, how many times are you going to circle the runway before you land the conversational plane, <laughs> John is for you. So we're going to circle the runway. So, um, but he identifies several purposes for writing this letter. Chapter 5, verse 13 I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. That's the big purpose right there. Mm -hmm. And it sounds an awful lot like the Gospel of John, right? Mm -hmm. That you may believe, and by believing, have life in his name. So he's writing for the same reasons here. That we may, that we who believe may know we have assurance that we have eternal life. <clears throat> That's a big reason. John is also combating a kind of heresy that has cropped up in these early churches. 
the broad term is Gnosticism. It begins with a G, those of you who are taking notes. The word gnosis in Greek, we get our word knowledge from it, that's why it begins with a K, um, if you've ever wondered. Um, and Gnosticism, it really took off in the 100s and 200s. It was a huge threat to the early church. It was the belief that there is a secret mystical knowledge that the elite can achieve. If you're good enough, you can graduate to get this secret mystical knowledge that the rest of the plebes aren't going to get. Or, if you pay enough, you can get this knowledge that the rest of the great unwashed will not get. This hasn't gone away, by the way. So, yeah. Scientology. Scientology. It's uh, their secret knowledge that you can attain that has been handed down from these great wise sources and only the right sort of people can get it. The same lies are still around today. Okay. A big part of this secret knowledge came from Greek philosophy, which was material things bad, spiritual things good. And that hasn't gone away either. A lot of people still think in those terms. And so with that come other heresies such as, if you want the theological term, not that it's important, it's, the, it's called docetism. <laughs> and that's the, the belief that Jesus didn't really take on a human body when he came to earth. He only seemed, the Greek word dokeo means seen, so docetism. It only seemed like, he looked like he took on a human body, but why would he take on a human body? We're trying to shed our human bodies and become spiritual because that's what's really good. We're trying to get rid of the material world, which is bad and wicked and evil. That's what's fallen. Our spirits are good. And so we're trying to shed the physical world and become pure spiritual people when we go to heaven. A lot of people, we're going to die and our spirits are going to go to heaven and that's where we're floating on clouds and playing harps and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Which is directly a contradiction to what the Bible teaches, that we're going to rise again with a new body to a physical earth that has been reclaimed and healed by God. And that Jesus took on a body... He still is in his human body at the right hand of God, and he's going to come again to this physical earth, and we're going to live and reign with him for eternity. The Greeks could not understand why anyone would want to believe anything as silly and ridiculous as that. And so they tried to find ways around it, fusing different thoughts together. And you get two different versions of the whole, the physical world doesn't matter. One school is the Stoics. You've heard of the Stoics, right? They said the world is, the material world is wicked, so refrain, eat as little as possible, drink as little as possible, restrain your emotions as much as possible, don't feel, because that's all worldly, and then there were the Epicureans. The material world doesn't matter, so eat, drink, and be merry, because who cares? Why are you not? Guess which one was more popular? <laughs> yes, imagine that. Not a lot of Stoics, lots of Epicureans. So John is writing to combat this, and we're going to see him say in this first chapter, I saw Jesus. I touched him. He was real. And he, he's going to insist on that. And you're going to say, why is he making such a big deal of that? Because there are a lot of people that said, oh, you thought you did. But he wasn't really human. Not like us. John's going to be like, look, I was there. <laughs> he was real. 
And then we're going to see him exploring Jesus' great commandment. <clears throat> what does it mean to love one another? There's a reason John is called the Apostle of Love. When we get to chapter 4, it's going to be love, 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 all over the place. That's all you need. So, well, so say some people from Liverpool. Yes. I gave you your outline there. Again, three main themes. If you want to break it down into three main themes, light, love, and life. Light, love, and life. John's going to say God is light. John's going to say twice, God is love. This is where that verse comes from. And he's going to be talking about life and what all it means. And one more little shorthand here before we dive in. The big question we're going to say over and over, how do we know? How do we know that we really are followers of Jesus? How do we know if our faith is for real? He's going to give us three tests. Number one, the moral test. Are you leaving behind your sin? Are you not sinning as much as you did before? Are you growing? Number two, the social test. Love. Do you really love your brother? You say you love God. If you love God, then you've got to love your brother. You've never seen God. You have seen your brother. Guess who's easier to love? You know? And then the doctrinal test. Do you truly believe Jesus became human being? He came to earth to live and to die for us. So we're going to look at those. Um, questions before we dig in? Yes, Olive. Um, as a random question. Was, do, do we know if this was written before or after the Gospel of John? I think after. Okay. But it's all... It's all within the relative the same time? It's all around the same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just curious because of trying to get the timeline in my head. But. Yeah. It's... The problem is there's there's no date. Well, I realize yeah. that. It's just... It's February 12th, <laughs> 1993. <laughs> I was just curious. Yes. Did... He, I'm assuming he was in Potmos then when he wrote Revelation? He definitely wrote Revelation from the Okay. All right. Whether he wrote <clears throat> these, he probably was still in Ephesus, but it's all we we can't know one hundred percent for sure. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. It sounded like uh, the elites that that they believe material. Uh, they didn't like material. They had thoughts. They their their knowledge. Right. Did they have money though? Because oftentimes that distinguishes them from the poor who have no thought, according to them. Right. It, it, it is interesting. Material things, oh, that's not what's important. But hands off my material coins. So, yes, because in order to succeed and be able to be educated, have right. books and all that, you have to have money. Right. It certainly does help. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just wondered how that yeah. worked. Very good point. Yeah. You expect them to be consistent? <laughs> well, today our, everything is sort of defined by economy. Mm -hmm. It was that and too. And if you don't have, then you're dumb. And if yep. you do have, then you're smart. And we and yet they were against did not invent things. that. We did not invent that. Right. Same term. Yeah. I saw another hand. Yes, Anne. It just, it just could. When they already were, were pulling at each other, <clears throat> this this soon after yep. Jesus was actually walking on earth, yep. it, it really is a miracle that we're all still here, kind of relatively believing. What in an incredible of, argument for at this time of year in particular. But, yeah, yeah. That, uh, and there's many out there trying to stop all that as well. You got and that have right. been for two thousand years. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It. Yeah. I always chuckle when I see a, a brand new church open and they say, we're going we're gonna to be like the New Testament church. <laughs> and I always I want to ask, which one? <laughs> like Corinth, where there was a guy sleeping with his mother-in-law and saying that it was good, <laughs> where they were broken up into factions and yelling at each other and screaming and getting drunk in the middle of church. Are you going to be like that? Is that, that the one the New Testament church going to be like? Or are we like... Ephesus, where they lost their first love, 
you know, and John mm -hmm. had to rebuke them. Or like Laodicea, where nobody was passionate about anything. Right. You know? <laughs> Which New Testament church are you going to be like? <laughs> yeah, they had problems from the very beginning because the church is made up of people. See, that's the problem. That's the problem every time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, who would like to read uh, chapter one and then a few verses into chapter two? Thank you, Lisa. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the proper... Propitiation. propitiation of our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoever keeps his word in him truly the love of God is perfected by this we may know that we are in him Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Okay. <clears throat> so that will take us through the rest of today. There's a, a lot in there. Um, sometimes when you're reading some of these letters, and especially if you're using a translation like this one, you begin to see quite obviously this was not originally written in English. Right? <laughs> FYI, there are three different kinds of translations of the Bible that you can get. This is a, a helpful rule of thumb for those of you. I know sometimes you're looking for a new Bible uh, and you want to know what kind to buy. There are what are called word-for-word -word translations like this, like the English Standard Version. Uh, the King James Version is like this. And that is, if the word is there in Greek or in Hebrew, it is translated into English. Even if that makes it very clunky <laughs> to read. Because languages, they don't match up sometimes, mm -hmm. the way that the language is conceived of and thought of. And so sometimes you have to process it and say, here's what they're trying to say. Okay, but I like to start with a word-for-word -word translation because everything's in there and nothing is left out. So that's why you're reading here and you see, behold, even though we don't say behold anymore, but it's in there. It's in the Greek, and so it's going to be translated and put in. In the middle, and this is... The New International Version and some others like it, you have what's called a thought for thought translation, mm -hmm. where they would might leave so out like, behold and other things like that. And they smooth out the translation a little bit to say, 
here's what they're trying to say, and here's how we would say it in English. <coughs> but that's an interpretation. It, and some people really don't like that, but it makes it easier to understand. If, if they are <coughs> truly, yes, exactly. If they are truly trying to be accurate, and that's we're not conveying their thoughts. That's where you have a translation committee, okay. as opposed to one person. But this is where you'll see Bible scholars really argue with each other. So where it says in the Hebrew, God will hold you in his kidneys, <laughs> they'll say God will hold you in his heart because we use a different organ than they do. That kind of a thing. Um, where it says and I apologize for the vulgarity, but this is literally what it says in the Old Testament at one point that this is directed to all who pee against a wall. Hmm. It'll say this is directed to all men. Because we know what they mean. <laughs> Women don't generally do that, right? <laughs> but we wanted, you know, the, they wanted a shock value kind of writing. So let's smooth that out a little bit. Then at the far end, you'll have what's a paraphrase, the message, the new li the, the living Bible, uh, those types of, where it's much further into interpretation. And that can be helpful to read because it'll shake you up sometimes. Yeah. I would never recommend using that as your main Bible, but there are times when it can be helpful, especially in some of the poetry and all of that, to, oh, that's what they were getting at. Okay, now let me go back and read it. Mm -hmm. the, okay, yeah, I like, you know, it makes you think. This beginning here is incredibly clunky. It's, I don't know if you noticed, we didn't get a verb until <laughs> verse three. <laughs> It's quite a run-on sentence, and I'm very glad in Greek class I never had to sit down and translate this because it would have driven me crazy. I've been like, where's the verb? Come on, you know? And so sometimes when you get a passage like this where you're just, it's going, and da, 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 it's helpful, find the verb and work your way back. The verb here is proclaim. proclaim. We are proclaiming something. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. So this is about proclamation. I have a little note here. John is moved to proclaim what he has witnessed in keeping with the commission he and the other apostles received. And the purpose of this proclamation is not just forgiveness of people's sins, but, but far richer for the gospel message binds together those who receive it. So if you go back and see what is it John is proclaiming, he's proclaiming that which was from the beginning. Well, I'm flashing back to the beginning of the gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, he says. And the word was with God and the word was God. So we're proclaiming something that goes all the way back to the very beginning. And we're talking about the same person, Jesus. At the beginning of John, the gospel, he's telling us, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. He goes all the way back to the very beginning. Here again, I'm going to proclaim something to you. It goes all the way back to the very beginning. The living word of God. And then he goes on to say, I heard it, he's using we, kind of a royal we in a way. I heard it, I saw it with my own eyes, I looked upon it, which is a stronger verb, not just I happened to glance at it, but I really looked at it and studied it and gazed upon it. I touched it with my own hands. It is all about the word of life that I'm proclaiming to you. That life, verse 2, was made manifest. 
God manifested it here on the earth, and I've seen it, and I'm going to testify to it and proclaim to you this eternal life, which was with the Father and made manifest to us. This I'm going to proclaim to you. Why? So that you too, verse 3, may have fellowship with us as we have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we, John and the other apostles, we saw what God did. The life was made manifest. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We saw him, we heard him, we gazed upon him, we touched him, we learned what he had, we saw what God is doing. We're going to testify to that, we're going to proclaim that, so that you can have the same fellowship we have. That fellowship is with us and with God. That's what John is saying here at the very beginning. This word of life that God made manifest, we're going to testify to it to you. And we're going to have this wonderful, rich fellowship, togetherness, intimate relationships with each other and with God. Not a casual relationship, but a true, deep, rich relationship. The truth is, really... The fellowship we have in the church is and should be richer and stronger than many of the family relationships that many of us have. Because while we say blood is thicker than water, however, if we don't have the same values and the same goal in life, if we're not living for the same purpose and the same reason, there's something that's always going to get in the way, right? There's always going to be a breach because we're going this way and they're going that way. The hope and the joy is when, as a family together, we also have spiritual fellowship. But you know, and I know there are a lot of people around the world, and here in the United States as well, that in order to become part of the church fellowship, they have to leave their family fellowship behind. Especially in Muslim countries, right? Where leaving, leaving behind the faith means maybe an honor killing, you know? In India too, uh, in Hinduism and Buddhism sometimes. Converting, it could, you could die for it. And in a much smaller way, I had a, a good friend in college that she grew up, uh, they went to church on the holidays, you know. They went on Easter, they went on Christmas, maybe if there wasn't something else. You know, it was the thing you did. And she went off to Griff City because that was where the family went to school, and she came on fire for the Lord. And... She started talking about how she wanted to serve in some way. You know, she was really trying to discern how God wanted her to use her life. And her parents finally said, no, wait, slow down. It, it's great that you're part of this club at school. You know, that's great. You're going through this phase. We understand. It's wonderful. You've made friends. Wonderful. You fit in. We love it. But... Come on. Don't take this too extreme. Yeah. <laughs> Don't change your major. She was thinking of changing your major. And, and you need to get a good job where you can make money. That's what's important. And she replied that money no longer was the number one goal of her life. And her parents were angry. <clears throat> You're going to throw your life away on this fable this fairy tale, you know, come on, nobody takes it seriously. You're really, what? And I can remember thinking as a, oh, well, this is for real here. You know, this is, this is the kind of thing that happens all over the world. It's had this much smaller way here in the United States, but by the way, she's still a believer. And her parents are dead. She's still, uh, she's still a believer. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, 
yeah, the, this fellowship is stronger in some ways than even family sometimes. And especially when you recognize that this fellowship together as the church means that also together we have true communion with God mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. But you can't separate out. It's not, I have this wonderful relationship, just me and Jesus. <laughs> you know, um, I saw someone yesterday that, oh, it's great to see you. Oh, we've been watching online. Good. Okay. Uh, can we see you again? We missed you. Yeah. It's really easy to love your neighbor when you never see your neighbor. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder when your neighbor's there in your face being annoying. You know? You know what I mean? It's great to love from afar. Do but we annoy you? Sometimes. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> and you know what? I'm going to admit, I know I annoy you sometimes. And that's part of loving each other. Yeah. If, if I don't, I promise I will. <laughs> yeah, it's people. People do that. We, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Right? There's sparks sometimes, and the challenge is to continue to love even when the sparks fly. So, John here. This is why um, that we have this fellowship, and we're writing these things. I love this verse, verse four, so that our joy may be complete. There is greater joy as the message goes forth and as the fellowship grows. And our joy gets greater and greater as more people accept uh, the good news. That's another theme of John here. We're going to talk a lot about joy. So, verse 5, we get down to brass tacks. This is the message that we heard from Jesus. This is the message we're going to proclaim to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Light conveys two different thoughts here. One is knowledge, right? We become enlightened as we learn, as we grow. We come out of the darkness and into the light, right? I see the light, we say, when we figure something out, when we have that aha moment, that eureka moment. God is knowledge and wisdom in that way. Um, Jesus is the truth, right? And the greater we come to know the truth, the greater we come to know him. Wisdom kind of fits in with that all through the Old Testament. The fear of the Lord, having a relationship of reverence and awe before the Lord is the beginning point for gaining wisdom. If you don't start with God, you're never going to get wisdom. A lot of people think they're wise. Paul talks about that in Corinthians. There's a lot of so-called elite, wise, very high up people that don't know a whole heck of a lot because they don't know God. My, uh, my grandma would sum people up. If they knew half, if they were half as smart as they thought they were, they'd be twice as smart as they really are. <laughs> that was one she loved to say. You can figure out the math on that one. Uh, I think it's they're a quarter as smart that, as they think they are. But, uh, Jesus is the truth. All true knowledge and wisdom come from him. And also with light is this idea of purity, right? We come away from the dark side and, and go to the light. In God, there is no darkness at all. There's no sin. There's no lies. There's no errors. There's no untruths. There's nothing dark about God. No mistakes. No mistakes. Yeah. Um, but God is light, 
that's going to make claims on me and how I live. Because if I say, verse 6, that I have fellowship with God, while I am walking in darkness, then I am not practicing the truth. But if I walk in the light, as he is in the light, then I have this fellowship, this church body of Christ fellowship, and the blood of Jesus cleanses me of all my sins. Those of you that know old school DC talk, as I'm sure you do, Lisa, yeah. I want to be in the light as he is in the light. Yes, it's where that comes from here. So, John's going to say this multiple times and in multiple ways throughout these verses. If we follow Jesus, if we walk with Jesus, and the Hebrew understanding is your life is your walk, you're walking a path, you're going from here to there, as you walk, if you are in a saving relationship with Jesus, then you must be in the process, and I'm going to add that helpful phrase, because so many people read this and get really, really scared. You must be in the process of leaving your sin behind and becoming more and more like Jesus. It's a two-step process. You can't have fellowship with God and keep on in your sins. And we're going to talk more about that. But theologically, they talk about mortification and vivification. Aren't these wonderful vocabulary <laughs> words you're learning tonight? Mortification, you see the word mort in there from the Latin, same word as mortuary. Yeah. Um, putting to death your sin. Putting that to death. And vivification, you are revived. Coming to life in your new identity in Christ. It's a two-step process, because it's not enough just to leave the bad habit behind. Because what happens when you leave one bad habit behind and you don't put something in its place? You go to the AA meeting, and you see they've left alcohol behind, but now they're smoking. Now they're doing internet gambling. Now they're doing all of these other addictive behaviors to fill that same void, right? Are they any better off? Well, they're not drinking. That's progress. So you, you kill your sin and you start living the way that Jesus wants you to live. It's an ongoing process of sanctification. We can never say, I believe in Jesus. Jesus forgave all of my sins. Now I'm going to go live how I want to live. Eat, drink, and be merry for it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission, right? <laughs> I love who you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> so, our sins will always get in the way, somehow, of having a relationship with God. This does not mean he is not saying if you are a Christian, you will not sin. He does not say that. In fact, he says the opposite of that. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So if somebody comes to you and tells you that they have achieved perfection, right. You're a big liar. You're lying to yourself. And that's a sin. And that's a sin, right? And that's a sin, yes. <laughs> I use these two verses as an assurance of pardon a lot in worship. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, which is part of this process of putting our sins to death and coming alive in Christ, God has promised he will be faithful, he will be just, he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But that is an active process. If you want fellowship with Jesus, then it's actively engaging a growth with him. Are you going to get it right all the time? No. But there is forgiveness. 
but we can never become complacent mm -hmm. in that. We can never say, you know what, it's good enough. It's enough. God never allows us to do that. But it's important to keep in mind the comfort that we have in the midst of this, because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. How can he do that? Because of what he did on the cross. God is faithful and just. How is it just to forgive me? It's never just to forgive me. Because God can never sweep my sins under the rug. God can never say, oh, well, no big deal. It is a big deal. He paid the price. He paid the price, which means justice is paid. Yes. Yeah. And so that judicial forgiveness, that being called not guilty by God, that can never be taken away. God's never going to say, oh, fooled you. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> the joke's on you. Or, I changed my mind. Yeah, April Fools, I changed my mind. No, when once saved, always saved. That's how I can give you an assurance of pardon on Sunday. Because we've confessed before God. We've come to Him to engage in our relationship with Him again. And we begin, we recognize God is great, God is holy, let us worship God. We sing His praises, and then we immediately come up against our sins. God is good, I am not. And so we confess. Before we move on to read his word, we take care of that, we are assured again of our forgiveness. And then it's, okay God, let me hear what you have to say so that I can continue to grow and become the person you want me to be. This walk with Jesus. Jesus even tells us when he gives us the pattern for prayer. Right? We begin addressing our father. our father. We begin with God. Who is God? He's in heaven. His name is hallowed. His kingdom is going to come. His will is going to be done. Then, Lord, take care of my present needs, my daily bread. Oh, and by the way, I've got a past. <laughs> Forgive my sins. Oh, and God, there's the future. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. And then we praise him again. That's the pattern Jesus gives us. If you want another example, think of a parent and child relationship, which is our relationship with God is a lot like that. When the child breaks the rules, I know your children never did, but when the child breaks the rules, do they cease to be your child? No. Does it strain the relationship? Is there trouble in the relationship until that is dealt with? Until there's a sit down and have a come to Jesus moment and somebody finally says, I'm sorry? Sure. So it is in our relationship with God. Do we ever cease to be God's children? No. But when we are in active rebellion against him, is that going to get in the way of having a deep, rich fellowship with God? You better believe it. And there are a lot of passages in Scripture where it says, this is why your prayers are not being effective. Because you want to talk about this over here, and God's like, we ain't talking about nothing until we deal with this. That you are actively rebelling against me. This is what I want to deal with. And I set the agenda. God says. And we all know, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, because we, we, we've been through this, right? We all have. What I've been through is probably different from what you've been through. We've all had something where it's, but I don't want to give that up. <laughs> you know? I really love being nasty and judgmental and talking about people behind their backs. It's fun when we do that. Besides, I'm right and they're wrong. Of course, and if people just thought like I did, the world would be a better place, right? Or whatever, it, it is your particular issue. And when it comes down to it, if you really love God, 
you will want to please him, right? Because that's what a loving relationship is like. You want to please the person that you love. You want to make them happy. That's the way love works. So John is saying the relationship has to be real, and that means you falling in line and following Jesus the best that you can. And you're not going to get that right 100% of the time. But if you're not engaging in the process, then we really need to stop and ask, do you really know the Lord? Because if you, you're not, then you don't. You think you do, but you don't. My little children, I'm writing these things, verse chapter 2, verse 1, so that you may not sin. If anyone does sin, wonderful. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He is, here's another vocabulary word for you, the propitiation for our sins. Stumble over that one. Propitiation means a sacrifice that takes away guilt. Or it can also, the, it, the, sometimes it's translated expiation, sometimes sacrifice of atonement. They all have different shades of meaning. They all mean an, an atoning sacrifice. And I says, says atoning, atoning sacrifice. sacrifice. Right. Um, propitiation has hints of dealing with God's anger specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so people really don't like that part. But um, Jesus is the one who was sacrificed to deal for with our sins, is what it's saying here. And... Uh, by this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. This is where the Pharisees in the crowd begin to get very nervous because, oh, there was that lie I told the other day because I didn't want to offend that lady when she said, do you like my new dress? It was the ugliest thing I have ever seen. I don't know why she bought that. It was hideous, but I told her it was nice. Because I didn't want to hurt her feelings, but that was a lie. That's so a white lie. So I'm breaking a commandment. <laughs> and, you know, we start getting really morbidly introspective, and we find all of the sins. Again, we have an advocate with the Father. However, if you are adopting a laissez-faire attitude, or if you're one of those people, I believe in God, I just, I worship God on my own. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I don't like organized religion. All of those things that we hear over and over, right? John just lays it on the line. Look, if you are not striving in your life to keep God's commandments, and there's some pretty specific ones about gathering together in worship with the church, there's some pretty specific ones about what to do with your money, there's pretty, some pretty specific ones about Sexuality. There's some pretty specific ones about all areas of our life. If you're just actively ignoring that and saying, I'm paying attention to everything else, but I'm not paying attention to that, have you really completely submitted to God? Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. Whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. This is how we know we are with him. Whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Are you showing Jesus in your life? Can people look at you and see him? And if you can say, I'm trying, you're good. That's, I said, remember there are three tests. This is, this is one of them. You know, you want to know, is your faith real? Look at your life. There will be evidence. You won't be perfect, but... Hopefully you can say, I'm not who I was, but I'm not who I used to be. I look back 10 years and I see, I have grown. The relationship is real. You know, because God is at work. So, questions, thoughts? Yes. Three questions. I'll give you two. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, your, the young lady from Grove. Uh -huh. Jesus had the same problem with his family. Yep. For his mother and James and Jude later. 
So God bless her. Yeah. That's that's not really a question. Okay, number two. It doesn't mention the lost, unforgotten God. It doesn't mention that you're going to have a helper with you. Right. I, I believe he does go on and talk later. about him later. Yes. Um, he just... He does not mention the Holy Spirit in this chapter. Um, so that's why it's important to read scripture in the whole context. Well, the Holy Spirit did come later. Right, but he's as he's saying, beginning. keeping the commandments, you don't do that completely in your own strength. The Spirit right. comes and, and helps you. And he said, you know, you have a help me, which is Jesus. Right. But you have a gift from them. Right. That yeah. Is makes all the difference in the right. world. Right. The third thing is where the church that I grew up in, um, once saved, always saved, was a Baptist thing. Mm -hmm. That once saved, always saved isn't the case. And it was pointed out about Judas. You know, probably all the disciples were baptized. All of them went through the process. So if Judas was baptized and saved, is it because he never really grew or he went against God? The, the answer to that, okay, so yes, once saved, always saved. If you really want to make people angry, <laughs> say that. <laughs> Partly why I like saying it sometimes. Um, <laughs> you really want to what? If you really want to make somebody angry, particularly a Baptist, that's a phrase you can say to make them angry, and that's delightful sometimes. Um, I, I think it's biblical. I think it, it, the, the biblical answer to, you know, what about the people that they, look, they looked like they were saved? Jesus himself teaches the parable of the sower. There are certain seeds that they sprout but they don't last. They, it was never real. They, they never sunk down deep, had deep roots. And... So they were not saved. As we're correct. Saying. They were never saved to begin with. <clears throat> um, Judas, obviously, included in that. Um, what people who are challenging that want to say, and it's an important point, is just because you have been baptized... Just because you are in church every Sunday, just because you do your memory verses, does not mean God. <laughs> does not mean you have. It, it's more than the outward forms, and that's true. But what they do is they take away your assurance that salvation is something that God does. And God doesn't, he's not an Indian giver. He doesn't give it to you and then take it away. So the assurance that we find over and over again in the Bible, you know, Debbie, you can t testify to this, how you never had any assurance growing up that you really were saved. Every day you were scared. And if you don't mind me telling it, getting on the road, you'd stop and try to confess all your sins just in case you got in a car accident. Yes, come at the end of the month to hear Debbie give fill the pulpit for me. Yeah. And be sure to smile at her and encourage her as she does so. So the, the, the assurance that, you know, if you truly do have a living relationship with God, that's never going to go away because God will make sure it doesn't go away. But it's more than just, well, go look on Judy's computer and see how many times I signed in on the pew pads. Clearly that means that's enough, right? Yeah. Sure. So. Are you a member of free will? We Both are true, yeah. We have been given this gift, but we can decline it too. We, yes, the, the gift is given, it can't be taken away, but we can 
cooperate with God's Spirit and grow or not grow. We can grieve the Spirit or we can keep in step with the Spirit. And I've done both in my life. Um, we all probably have done both. Um, and that's why we have Bible study, is to encourage you to keep in step. And yeah, grow in your relationship with God. Yeah, Linda. This may sound like a, a silly question, but... There are no silly questions. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, whenever you see verses that say, confess your sin, okay, is that confession directly to God? Are we recognizing our sin to Him? Or does there have to be another party involved? A, a, another person? Right. <coughs> so... <coughs> We believe you can direct, you can confess directly to God through Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. But we also recognize there are times when it is helpful if there's another human being to an accountability partner or your pastor, um, counselor. counselor. Yeah, sometimes that other person can help you see what you're missing, or remind you of the truth of forgiveness <clears throat> that you maybe don't dare go to because you're so consumed by your guilt and, and your shame. Uh, so I never want to take away the, the joy of being able to confess directly to God. Uh, but if you need to make an appointment and come and talk with me. Uh, my door is open. <laughs> There's a, that, that's a very specific step in the 12 steps of AA. Yeah. And step seven is you need to confess to you, bring yourself to God and to another human being yeah. the nature of your wrongdoings. Yeah. So, um, and to, to allow somebody to hold you accountable. It really is a huge difference. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Because we will deceive ourselves Absolutely over will. and over. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I do have an accountability partner I get together with every week, and we we do confess to each other and hold each other accountable, and sometimes he annoys me, and sometimes I annoy him, <laughs> and that's how it should be. <laughs> oh, so you're having a problem with that. Let's talk more. I don't want to talk more, but we're going to talk more about that. <laughs> yeah. So everybody needs it. Other thoughts, questions? I have an announcement. Yeah. Oh, yes. We need to reset this room for the stop sale. So I have a little map on those who were able. I would really appreciate the help. We need to move <coughs> the chairs out and then move these tables up against the wall and move some other tables in. So if, if you were able, please do stay in health. And, and there, there's cake for those of you that help. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cake. Yes. Could we also add heart to prayer? Yes, prayer? absolutely. Yeah. So I'm sorry I kept you late tonight, but as you see, there was a lot in here. And yeah, let's uh, let's close with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for being our advocate. Thank you for accepting our confessions and for giving us the gift of forgiveness. Thank you that you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. We pray that you would help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. Help us to grow in our relationship with you. And Lord, we lift up all of our loved ones who do not know you as they should. And we pray that you would use us to enlighten them and to point the way that they may come to know and love you as we do. We especially remember Art, Lord, as he is in hospice care. We ask your blessing upon him and upon Phyllis. And Lord, all of those that will be coming into our church this weekend for Bountiful Hearts or for the stuff sale, we pray that somehow seeds would be planted for those that do not know you, that that relationship would begin. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hope you enjoy.